I'm Tamsin Rose, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. And I'm delighted to welcome you. We're just waiting a few seconds to allow people to join from Zoom. And this afternoon, we are going to be talking about why urgent action on the EU zero pollution ambition matters for health. And we're going to be hearing voices from communities and vulnerable groups who are most exposed and affected by pollution. And let me just give you some sh brief housekeeping rules. This is a webinar and it's being recorded and we will be using the recordings for communication purposes and on social media. Um, we have allowed two different ways for you to interact with us. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see in your menu, you have a chat function and a Q&A. The Q&A is for you to submit questions to our panelists. Please use the chat function if you have technical issues, you need some help, you can't hear anything, that's what it's for. So we're separating off the dialogue with our speakers with requests for technical support. We're delighted to offer you interpretation today. And this event is being simultaneously interpreted between English and French. If you'd like to use that, you need to look at, again at the bottom of your screen and you'll see there's a round globe and it says interpretation. If you click on that, you'll be able to choose English or French. And that way you'll be able to see and hear the language that we're using. So this is our program for this afternoon. We have a fantastic uh, set of speakers who are joining us and we're privileged to have them amongst us. And let me just introduce who they'll be in, in a moment. But before I do that, just to set the scene, I'd like to introduce Janon Jensen, who is the executive director of HEAL, the organization that's hosting this webinar. And she's gonna give us an understanding of why we're talking about zero pollution, why now and why it's so important. Janon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tamsin, and welcome everybody. My name is Janan Jensen, and I'm the founder and executive director at the Health and Environment Alliance. And it's really my honor to welcome each and every one of you today at our online event. So thank you for being with us. So why does urgent action on the EU's zero pollution ambition matter for health? And why did we invite people who are most affected by pollution, but rarely heard to speak up today? The stories of contaminated communities and populations have inspired and fed into our work since I founded HEAL almost 20 years ago, alarmed at how pollution was harming people's health, particularly those most vulnerable. The stories have also helped shape our vision of a healthy planet for healthy people and also for building up our advocacy on EU environment and health policies. For almost two decades, our Alliance has worked to raise awareness about the detrimental effects of environmental pollution to our health and put disease prevention on policymakers' minds and agenda. Together with our members and partners, we've heavily invested in conveying the scientific facts and figures about the multiple health conditions and diseases, sometimes with transgenerational effects, all of which are associated to toxic pollution in the air water or our food. But we've also made sure to communicate on some good news. That is that ambitious EU environmental policies to reduce pollution and prevent disease also prevent disease. And that offers a great public health win. We've repeated time and time again that preventing pollution at every source is urgent. It has to be done with binding and enforceable legislation and it has to be guided by the latest science. Our community work has paid off with the 2019 EU elections and the EU's commitment to a zero pollution ambition under the EU Green Deal, we finally see a landscape shift and that is music to our ears. It's a major achievement for our environmental health groups to see a narrative, one even more powerful and concrete and what the EU is aiming for zero pollution for healthier people and a healthier planet. HEAL's overarching demands for transitioning to this zero pollution are threefold. Zero harm from pollution, that's what we're gonna talk about today, zero money for pollution, and zero delay in stopping the pollution. 
Now we have an amazing opportunity right before our eyes to ensure that the EU laws and actions are aligned and prioritize health within the Green Deal and the zero pollution ambition. And we very much hope it's speedy and ambitious implementation. The stories that we're gonna to hear today are gonna to help us do that. And we promise to spread them far and wide. You are contributing to Hill's mission to ensure that the health evidence and health voices are heard by politicians and policymakers in Europe and beyond to protect those most harmed by pollution. Your sharing real life stories on the health harm of pollution will give us testimony and a human face on the urgency and importance to aim for air pollution, zero pollution. They will also inspire us. And most importantly, they will put a spotlight on some of the diseases that are linked to environmental pollution, such as cancer, lung and heart disease, allergies and asthma, diabetes, obesity, or Parkinson's disease, to name a few. Today's event couldn't come at a better time. We're just days ahead of the launch of the EU Zero Pollution Stakeholder Platform, of which HEAL is a proudly a member, and which today's Commission's representative, Veronica Manfredi, will surely talk about at the end of the event. So on behalf of HEAL, its board and its members, we warmly invite you to sit back, put on your listening ears, and open your heart to voices from Anne, from Julian, from Laura, from Roseman and from Bascute, who are all members or representatives of affected communities and vulnerable groups. We are really deeply grateful to you all for being with us here today. And with this, I would like to hand over to Tamsin Rose. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janon, for explaining, but the ambition that you've set out in HEAL, that when the Commission's proposal on you know, zero pollution comes forward, that it you, your three tests, your criteria for success should be that it should be have zero harm, zero funds for pollution and zero delay in implementation. I think those are very clear and very simple to understand. And our panel are going to explain just why that matters and illustrate it with stories from their own lives and their communities. So you can see on screen who we have, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Laura Facciola, Dr. Anne Lindist, Rosamund Kissy Debra, Julian Guillard and Baskut Tunchuk who will be all sharing their stories and their path that brought them towards activism and the kinds of campaigns that they want to use to achieve change. And as uh, Janon has said on behalf of HEAL, it's so important that people who have the most exposure and suffer the most impact, their voices are heard and listened to by the policymakers. So let me start by uh, inviting uh, Laura, Dr. Laura, to um, unmute yourself Put, put your camera on and tell us, tell us your story. How has pollution impacted in your life and what has you, that made you want to do about it? So first of all, thanks for um, inviting me to this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, my name is Laura Facciolo. I'm part of the Mamen of Us group uh, of Italy. Uh, we are, I will share my screen just to show you uh, some images of uh, taken from our website. So uh, we are a large group of people uh, based in the Veneto region in the northeast of Italy, where unfortunately uh, we discovered five years ago uh, almost to have a, a big problem in terms of uh, PFAS contamination due to a company that was discharging PFAS uh, into the, um, uh, let's say, into the uh, small river and also contaminating uh, in the aquifer. Um, um, the, I will show you just to give you an idea of the area that was impacted. We are speaking about uh, a total of uh, uh, 50 municipalities uh, with more than uh, 300,000 people impacted. The, um, the area with the highest uh, uh, impact in terms of uh, PFAS contamination is uh, um, uh, having uh, um, more than 100,000 inhabitants. And uh, unfortunately, as you can see, we are divided into different areas depending on the different levels of contamination that uh, our environment uh, adds. 
and also uh, depending on, unfortunately, how, how deep was the effect on uh, uh, on the water that we were taking. Because uh, in the red area that uh, you can see here, we had uh, a triple level of uh, uh, contamination, due, uh, of water contamination, because uh, the, um, the, wa the water coming from the waterworks was contaminated, so tap water, then also the aqueduct, uh, sorry, the um, aquifers, uh, so the groundwater, was contaminated and uh, the rivers were contaminated too. So what happened is that at the end, also our food was contaminated and uh, the, our region performed some uh, um, analysis on the food and uh, uh, we immediately asked to see the uh, whole results to check what was the situation. And unfortunately, they did not provide them. So we were forced at, at the end to go to appeal to the regional administrative court, who uh, then forced region to provide us with these results. Uh, we provide these results to uh, epidemiologists who analyze them. And uh, unfortunately, the situation is uh, not good as we were expecting. And we still have not any right, it seems, to understand what these, the, uh, which kind of food can be um, taken from and, uh, and without issues in our region. Uh, we are also facing uh, um, a trial against uh, the company managers of Mitteni uh, that now is in bankruptcy. And uh, um, we are in almost 100 civil parties. Uh, so simple citizens that are trying to provide their, to give their opportunity to participate to this trial and help the court to understand what happened and to find out who were the guilty. Uh, we are also having uh, uh, a crowdfunding in place in order to face all the costs of this, uh, um, of the trial. Uh, so in case you, you will see our website, I really encourage uh, you to, to have a look. Uh, you will also see our uh, page where we are explaining uh, what we are doing in terms of crowdfunding. So for example, uh, tomorrow and Sunday, we'll be, we will be in the squares of our municipalities with some flowers just to raise some funds to, to, um, to proceed with the trial. Uh, what we are asking, we are asking not to uh, have other parts in the world facing the same issues that we are facing. We do not want to have any other children have, mm, uh, having this compound in, the, in their blood. And uh, uh, we have a lot of people here suffering from different diseases that are PFAS correlated. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we are still waiting for a real epidemiologic study. So I hope uh, uh, all our efforts will be uh, will um, proceed and have uh, something done in the near future. Thank you very much, Laura. And I'm, I'm particularly struck by the activism and the, the women who came together to demand an answer and when necessary, you know, using legal means in order to force the regional authorities to do what they should have done, which is recognise a, a legitimate risk to their citizens and act to protect them instead of you having to do this on your behalf. So thank you for that and sharing the story and what brought to people together and the extent to which you've engaged a community in, in fighting this and also that you're still waiting for a real epidemiological study which would perhaps show even more impact than you've been able to gather yourselves. So thank you for sharing your story, uh, Loha. Let me now invite Julien to um, share his story and his experience from France. Julien. Bonjour, bonjour à toutes, bonjour. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this invitation, and it's very important for us to uh, have this opportunity to speak on behalf of the victims for pesticides. I'm, my name is Julien Guillard, I'm 37. I live in 
France, in Western France, Nantes. And a few years ago, we uh, in 2016, uh, I was discovered that I had a type of blood cancer, which is a in disease amongst mostly aging population. The doctor was curious to know why I, at my age, had this type of cancer. And so we uh, looked at my career. And when I told him that I had been a farm worker for many years and that I had used pesticides uh, in a rather random, uh, uncontrolled manner, uh, she immediately uh, drew a link with between pesticides and cancer. And during my chemo, I uh, put together a claim for a professional disease because in France we have a system which allows us to uh, have uh, work-related accidents um, dealt with specially. And in this, um, so as I had to fill in this administrative application for this to be qualified as a work-related ac uh, accident. And in 2017, I was recognized uh, as a victim of pesticides with this um, cancer, which was uh, seen to uh, blood cancer, which seemed to be recognized as the result of pesticides. And when I put together this application, I had to uh, bring a number of um, pieces of uh, paperwork together. And so unfortunately, my story is so uh, mundane, uh, but it does say a lot about uh, the use of pesticides. These stories are to be found uh, with many victims of pesticides. Um, the uh, farm uh, seed was uh, coated with insecticides. Uh, still manufactured in Europe, but prohibited in Europe, which is red powder, which was used to coat seeds to protect them. And we did that in a cement mixer. There's a lot of dust and we were just alongside. Uh, we didn't have any protective equipment uh, because nobody had told me about the chemical risk. And my boss did the same. And we weren't really aware of the danger at that time. Uh, we had headaches, so uh, we had a bit of nosebleeds, but in farming, uh, we were pretty, uh, not, you know, going to run to the doctor straight away. Uh, we think, oh, we're never going to be ill. We're tough guys. And uh, I then left farming, but I then went into landscape gardening, uh, so maintaining green spaces and so on. And we unfortunately uses, used another uh, well-known herbicidal product, and I thought I was lucky at the time because it was uh, warm, uh, very warm where I was. And I, I had this uh, and a leak in my spray, uh, which I used. And so, in fact, I was constantly being sprayed with this mix of water and pesticides and other plant care products. And I thought that was a good thing because I was being kept cool during heat waves. But when I went to see my doctor and uh, they diagnosed cancer, I realized that I was not at all uh, fortunate because I've been in constant touch with pesticides without any awareness at all of there being any type of danger. And with uh, the recognition of professional diseases, we get some recognition of this, uh, seeing that our work uh, led to poisoning, and this was acknowledged, that's a good thing. Um, there are also some financial compensation as a result of that. But what is important to understand is that this, that as well, it, that this compensation should not just be for uh, French citizens in the system, but for all our European neighbors. And perhaps we'll come back to that later when, when it comes to other aspects, but we have a compensation funds for the victims of pesticides in France. And the idea would be for this fund to become European in scope. And I'm, I'm keen to raise awareness of that. And that is why I'm here with you today uh, to make people aware uh, of the risk from chemicals. And also in particular, those people who are in close contact with these type of products is very important because that is how I came across Fito Victim, which is this uh, association nonprofit which uh, helps victims of uh, pesticides. I joined in 2017, I'm now vice president and we're also uh, uh, with you today as a result of that membership. Thank you very much. 
Julian, very interesting. Again, you, you shared your, your path and I was very struck by a few things that you said. The first was that neither you or your boss had any idea about the risks that you were running and nobody used protective equipment because nobody knew what the problem was. And then when you changed career, but was all still in contact with uh, chemicals on a professional basis, Again, you weren't aware of the risks and were therefore not able to take measures that might protect you. And I, I think this is a very interesting route for potential victims of um, exposure to take this occupational health and health risk approach, because there are, as you say, uh, officially already recognized procedures. And they, they date from 50, 60 years ago when we had the exposure of asbestos for, for workers. So this is an interesting route. And I'm sure we'll talk about that with the audience is how you could use that um, as, a, as a method to get recognition, compensation, and to raise the profile of the risks of workers in the workplace environment. So thank you for that, Julien. Uh, Dr. Anna Lendinst, would you like to now share your story and perhaps you can make, make the reference about the exposures and the impact on health that you've experienced? Uh, thank you, Tamsin. Of course, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to tell you a bit more, a bit more about myself um, and how uh, the air around me uh, influenced my life. Um, I was born about uh, 50 years ago in uh, Amsterdam, uh, the city of Amsterdam, um, and grew up uh, more on the outskirts of Amsterdam, quite near the airport. Um, and I come from a family with lung disease. And as a child, I had uh, loads of infections, uh, ENT infections and chest infections. Um, and I missed uh, several days of school. Um, uh, I, I missed a lot of education, but also playing with friends, going outside, playing with friends. Um, and I had to spend a lot of time just inside the house. Uh, I also had a, uh, I still have a little brother and he is, um, um, uh, he has asthma, he also has asthma and he had asthma as a child and he was often admitted to hospital. Um, and then I had to miss my mother because she was with my brother. Uh, later on, I um, moved to Utrecht uh, and later on, I moved to Edinburgh, Scotland to study. Um, and I um, studied for uh, clinical pharmacy. Um, and during the time as a when I was studying in Scotland, uh, I was not able to uh, run uphill. Um, and um, well, for me as a Dutch person, it was sort of a mountain. And I just couldn't run it up, couldn't run up the hill. So uh, I went to the GP and he diagnosed me with asthma and he um, prescribed me medication and it did, it did work. But uh, unfortunately uh, for me, uh, I wasn't able to sing anymore because of the side, side effects of the medication. Um, and I hated it. So I yeah, I stopped sometimes the medication and then restarted. And yeah, uh, it was quite a dilemma actually uh, for me. Um, back in the Netherlands, I, uh, I worked for the, in research for the medical center um, and my asthma got worse and worse. And around at the end of 2014, I had a chest infection um, uh, and I was living in the, Utrecht uh, in this in the city, um, and I couldn't uh, I could no longer breathe uh, or do the things I wanted to do. And since uh, this chest infection, I never really recovered. Um, I can't uh, I can't work anymore. Um, I have a son, and uh, I can't just go to uh, bring him to school or watch his uh, field hockey or cricket games. Um, so it has a lot of impact on my life uh, and also on the people who are surrounding me. Uh, uh, my husband and my son, of course, uh, also my parents. My mother is actually at the end stage of her life and I 
just wanted to be with her, but that's, for me, that's not possible. Um, at the moment, I escaped this, the, the, the center of Utrecht um, and I uh, moved uh, temporarily to up north in the Netherlands, near the coast, near the sea, the North Sea, uh, uh, by myself. Um, and I'm really improving. Uh, I can walk my dog again. In October, I wasn't able to uh, to walk my dog uh, just for a few hundred meters, and that was it. And now I can walk for ki kilometers again. Um, in the picture uh, you see on the screen, you see me in a hospital bed. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, if I look at the picture, I was I was using a lot of prednisolone. Um, and the other picture was me in the snow. Uh, I went. I was admitted to the asthma clinic in Davos, Switzerland. Um, uh, and there's a there's clean air over there, and there's uh, uh, I can do things again, uh, like uh, cross country skiing. Um, and it was such a difference; it was almost bizarre what clean air can do. Um, and uh, even now, it's it has so much impact on my life. Uh, I suffer a lot about from uh, people. I live because they live in the in this in an old part of the town from the, from the city with a lot of chimneys uh, and people like to burn wood uh, especially in the pole so that's why it's worse now in this period yeah. and clean air uh, over here uh, when there are not many houses uh, it's it's a huge difference Thank you very much, Anne, for, for sharing this story and the quite dramatic pictures which show you could almost say they look like different people. One is clearly active and free and able to move around and has enjoyment and passion. And the other person is, is very clearly unwell and in the hospital. And that, that's the same person. And the, the difference there is the quality of the air around. I think that's a, a really important message. And thank you again for sharing just, just how sensitive um, people's lungs can be and what a difference this isn't about coughing in the corner one day this is very real very major impact on the ability to to function and have a full family or uh, professional life so thank you for sharing your story uh, Anne. we're now going to have a uh, video message from Rosamond Kissy Deborah whose uh, daughter um, unfortunately uh, had a, a major asthma attack and died as a result of it and for the first time ever on a death certificate in the UK they recorded air pollution as a cause of death which was a, a huge landmark victory for the advocacy uh, of Rosamond so let's hear her message. My name is Rosamond Adukisi Deborah I'm the founder and director of the Ella Roberta Family Foundation it was set up in memory of my late daughter um, you've come to film me today I am in my office I'm also the WHO advocate for health and air quality. Um, and basically the foundation was set up in my late daughter's memory and it was to find out why she died. It's also to promote research into asthma and also to look at the impact of air pollution on human health. And what is it that you want to ask policymakers in Europe and around the world to do? I absolutely right now have one ask. As we all know, the WHO guidelines came out recently and this has been worked on for almost 15 years and they have realised that even with the old guidelines, 8.8 .8 million people were still dying prematurely. So therefore these new guidelines which are going to be adopted, hopefully, by countries, it could save 80% of the people that die. So I urge all governments everywhere now to have a, to have a look at these, these new guidelines and to implement them, and they will save, they will save human life, really. Children, um, older citizens, and their populations at general. Look, air pollution is the biggest environmental disaster of our time. And these guidelines will tell us that our governments 
care about our health and well-being. And I believe that clean air is a human right. And it's about time now with all the evidence, people stop talking and start taking action now. Fossil fuels are killing us. Thank you for that. What a clear message uh, from Rosamond that, you know, if we don't take action, we're condemning hundreds of thousands of people to die and largely their children who are, who, who are most exposed are people with underlying conditions, the people who are least able to be resilient to the pollution that's attacking their bodies. This is really a life saving issue. And it's rare when we talk in a policy context about something that has got such direct impact and the capacity to change lives for the better and to save lives. So let me now pass to uh, Baskut Tunchik, who is our, our last speaker on our panel. And we just heard there very clearly from Rosamond. She said this is a human rights issue, that access to clean air and the ability not to be harmed by pollution is a human right. And of course, this is your special role because you're the UN Special Reporter on Toxics and Human Health. So what would you like to share with us? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, to participate in this interesting panel. Uh, thank you to, to HEAL for organizing uh, this so that we can highlight the, the situation that faces many communities in Europe and elsewhere around the world. Uh, just a, a point of clarification, I'm the, the former Special Rapporteur on, on Human Rights and Toxics. Uh, I held that position up until June of 2020, so a little over a year ago. Um, in, in that context, uh, I would have to say that one of the greatest privileges I had was to work with communities that were impacted by pollution. It was uh, profoundly humbling and I'm immensely grateful for the many victims who spoke to me about the struggles that they faced on a daily basis involving their exposure to, to various forms of pollution in their environment. Um, exploitation can take many forms, as we all know, but in my view, one of the most heinous ways is how communities have been exploited by their, their exposure to toxics and pollution. Um, it, it seems to me that these pillars of international order that we often speak about in UN discussions, such as justice and human dignity, equality, accountability, they, they almost seem forgotten or ignored when we're discussing issues around pollution, how it's released, and then later on how it's addressed when impacts emerge. Uh, unfortunately, the scientific uncertainty that inevitably exists uh, is often abused to no end, delaying and denying access to an effective remedy, which in and of itself is a violation of the letter and the spirit of human rights, in my view. The, the image you, you see uh, on the screen is, is one of the cases that I had the opportunity to look into. It's a, <clears throat> it's a area of, of Canada, Ontario, Canada, that's been dubbed Chemical Valley. It's home to 40% of Canada's chemical industry. Uh, and there are about 60 chemical plants, oil refineries, plastic producers, and, and other facilities uh, that surround an indigenous reserve on all three sides. Um, the the Amjawang uh, First Nation has lived there uh, for hundreds of years in Sarnia. And over time, they found themselves surrounded by these highly polluting industries. Uh, there, there are 400 people, I'm sorry, no, 800 people that live in the green patch that you see in the photo, the aerial photo there. And, and they, they live in extremely close proximity to, to chemical refineries and, and other facilities uh, that are polluting their environment. The, the blue building that you see is the primary school for the children of that community. And so they, they are simply a stone throw away from, from a, a chemical plant that is processing uh, tar sands from, from Northern Alberta and raising and highlighting the linkages between toxic pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and climate change uh, due to tar sands and fossil fuels. Uh, the, the community has uh, endured countless uh, health impacts, which are 
undoubtedly human rights impacts in, in my view. They've been exposed to 1,800 kilograms of toxic substances per resident uh, based on a, a study that was conducted a little over a decade ago. They suffer from the highest level of particulate matter emissions in Canada, although that has recently declined, fortunately, but still is very high. Um, the community has experienced uh, birth ratios that have been two to one of girls to women, uh, girls to, to men, and physical health impacts ranging from cancers to heart disease, respiratory illnesses, and other associated health impacts. But it's not just the physical impacts that they face, they also have endured uh, psychological issues uh, from sirens that continue to blare throughout the day and night, uh, making them wonder if, if this, is, this is the siren where their, their home is gonna be destroyed by an explosion. Um, and they've also felt the, the, the psychological burden of feeling like, um, like their community is sacrificial. And, and their rights are not being respected. Um, this, the experience of, of this community is, is one, one of the, the most uh, profound uh, that I would say that I've come across in terms of the situation, the unique situation they're in being surrounded on all sides essentially by chemical plants. Um, but they, they are not unique in terms of the impacts that they're experiencing and the violation of their rights uh, due to pollution. Uh, in, and in nearly every case that I've worked on, there have been impacts on children uh, from, uh, from pollution. Uh, and these have often been the greatest, the greatest risks of health impacts, uh, but also those children have faced the greatest obstacles in having their rights respected, their substantive rights and their procedural rights, including their right to be heard. For example, in Kosovo, children today uh, continue to be denied access to an effective remedy. Um, hundreds of children died in South Korea uh, from respiratory illnesses due to a humidifier sterilizer that was exported from, from a European country. Um, children of pregnant women who used pesticides or other industrial chemicals. Um, these are just a few of the different cases that have, have come up uh, that came up during my tenure as the UN Special Rapporteur. Um, in, in my view, every child has the right to a, a healthy environment. Um, this, this comes uh, through many different uh, legal instruments, but uh, most clearly to me is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. When you put the provisions of that convention together, it's very clear to me that every child under that convention has the right to a healthy environment or should have the right to a healthy environment. Sadly, however, pediatricians continue to lament uh, that we're suffering from a silent pandemic of disease, disability, and even death, in some cases, uh, of children who are enduring toxic pollution. Um, under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, states have an obligation to ensure that the best interests of the child are prioritized in developing environmental laws. Uh, states have a duty to prevent exposure. Uh, this is implicit under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And to this end, the zero pollution commitment of the EU is fundamental and necessary to secure the right of every child to a healthy environment, to fulfill the obligations of, of every state that's a member of the European Union towards children uh, within their territory. And so I urge the EU to find the necessary ambition uh, the necessary urgency in implementing a zero pollution agenda uh, that will be able to secure the right of every child to a healthy environment. And thank you. Thank you very much, Abascus. And I was particularly struck by this image that you shared, you know, of this community surrounded on three sides by, you know, industrial buildings and activities. And, I, and you, you mentioned how the precautionary principle is used and abused and twisted and in many ways. And in my experience, there's often, a, particularly for communities in, in, that are in, in deprived, that there is a trade-off that's being presented to them explicitly. You either have jobs and opportunity, or if you try and shut these things down, then you will lose out. So there, it, it puts the communities that have very little agency and political control in a position of this unenviable choice. Do we want jobs 
for our local community or do we want clean air or a, a lack of pollution and i think that's a, a high, beautifully illustrated by the images that you put there that for that community that what's surrounding them is also possibly the only place for, for local communities to get jobs and it's this this difficult choice that's being put and the, the it's all on their shoulders as a burden to carry and i'm sure we'll pick up on that but thank you again for that I'm, I'm delighted to say I think we have uh, Rosaminda Kissy Deborah is with us, who's joined us. Can I invite you to unmute yourself? Hello, lovely Thank to you. see you. We've just watched your video. Thank you. It was wonderful to see it, but it's lovely to have you live and that you're able to join us. Do you want to add in some elements? You've probably just listened to Basket there, and we've been hearing different stories of how pollution have impacted on health and well-being. What would you like to add? Yeah, do you know what I was actually doing? I was about to email Sarah and ask her, interesting enough, just hearing that gentleman speak, I've just come on, that whether I could get a copy of the recording and send it to my lawyer. So that probably shows you how powerfully I felt he was speaking and how paramount the rights of the child is. And next week will be a year since the verdicts of the um, inquest into my late daughter. And the coroner was incredibly clear about what had happened to her, i.e. the reason why she had asthma in the first place. Um, it, it, you know, air pollution was responsible and ultimately it caused her death on the final night. And just hear, hearing him, the gentleman, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name so I don't want to do it wrongly, talking about the rights of the child really riled me and I straight away thought about COP, the difference between uh, phasing out and phasing down. I hope I've got that right because I wasn't even expecting to speak. I, I was just so riled by that and thought my lawyer needed to see this about how children are continuing to suffer and it's a crime and somebody really, really needs to be held responsible. This cannot continue, by the way. We all know what the problem is and yet nothing is being done. And, you know, my daughter may be the first person to have it on her death certificate, but she won't be the last. And that shows you the immediate reaction I get when I hear someone speak so powerfully about this matter. But I am, you know, it's a year next year and the coroner was very clear. And yes, I've had conversations with the government. I'm not going to deny that, but I am after real action, but it's not just the UK government. And again, I urge the medical, you know, everybody in health to really make their voices heard because they see these children firsthand. They see them repeatedly. And unless something is done, I'm afraid this is going to continue. And I can't stress it any clearer. You've just caught me in the middle of trying to text someone to get a recording of this to send to my lawyer. There is, there is only so much I feel we can do, but we also need to really get the public involved on this matter. Like I said, every, it is their right not just to, you know, it is their right to breathe clean air and children everywhere are being poisoned by different things. Pollution is one, incinerators, and I could name numerous things. And this is a crime and it needs to stop basically. And I feel we all know what the problem is. And yet we keep on going round and round. And I'm very concerned that whilst we all continue to talk, the children are continuing to suffer. And where is the real and proper effective action coming from? So that's my initial comment. Sorry, I have only just um, joined you, but that's my initial comment. So I do apologize to the speakers before that I'm sure I have missed their powerful talks, but I now feel next year going forward, we need to do something. There needs to be something that we take to COP27 from everyone from health. And, you know, we always talk about the environment, but I really want us to view this as a health crisis, by the way. I really, really strongly do. I feel unless we step up, these children, it doesn't matter where they are in the world. And I've said this to different children who have written to me. I might be based in the UK, but a child's life in Africa, India, wherever is just as valid. And I do think, I'm not sure what, because I don't have all the, all the answers, but I do think I can't let my daughter's verdict just 
go by the wayside if if you see what i mean and wait till there's another child who dies and we go through the same thing again that's my tasman that's my initial reaction to the conversation thank you very much um uh, rosamond for sharing that and he, indeed of course the recording we will share it with you so that you can use it because we had some fantastic uh, uh speeches by some of our earlier uh, members of the panel and I'd, i one one thing that strikes me very clearly rosamond you said you know that the coroner had a clarity of vision and was able to say clearly this is the cause it's air pollution and that we we lay the blame at the door of air pollution earlier julien said he had a doctor who was curious because the type of blood cancer that he was diagnosed with is not normal for some of his age. And instead of just writing it off saying, it just happens, he said, how did it happen? Let's find out more. Um, and I'm particularly interested, we had the mamas, um, Laura had the mamas in Italy who started to investigate, hang on, what's happening here? And had to use legal means to force the authorities to reveal the results of a study to understand what was affecting them. So it sounds to me like we, there's a common theme coming through here that you need to have uh, an organization, and pre presumably it's the, the health community who are first seeing these impacts, who have both the curiosity and the commitment, the engagement to say, hang on, there's something here that needs to be done. We, we heard um, from Laura how we can use lawyers and Rosamond, you mentioned lawyers as well. We heard from Julien how there is a, a mechanism in France that allows a process to recognize if a worker has been harmed in an occupational process. And it's it, it dates back to uh, occupational um, exposure to things like asbestos and other things in the workplace. But he was able to use that existing process to make the case of pesticide exposure harming his health. And he also highlighted again that he and his, his colleagues and his boss were happily using these chemicals with no idea of what risks they were running and therefore no ability to manage the risk. So we've had lots of interesting elements that we might like to pick up on in our conversation. And the, the other thing is, I think something that's coming through is the accountability. Who is accountable for the harm, for judging the harm, assessing the harm, and therefore taking action for change? And this is something that, you know, is, is clearly uh, at the foot at the door of the policymakers to do this. And as Janon said at the beginning, this webinar is just a few days before the Commission launches its zero pollution policy framework. And we hope that the messages are coming through. Now, I invite I just, you, just, yes, just of course. Before I go, monitoring is key and how we monitor, because if we are to go down the legal route, we will need evidence. And how we monitor is very key. So we, we all know the pollution is at the pram level. So obviously if we are monitoring something at six volts, it's going to look, and there are some places that don't monitor at all. So may I remind everyone again, please, monitoring and how we monitor is key. Otherwise, when you go to court, they will throw it out. So we really need to, the first step, I think, even before we think about legal action, is getting the authorities to monitor. I think this, and I, I am stressing this very strongly, because otherwise people will take action and get to court and then realize they don't have, the evidence is really crucial. And that is what we had in my late daughter's case. And I know there are lots of places where there is no monitoring at all. So please, that is the first step, because we can't just go to court, we're going to need evidence. So I keep on repeating the same thing again, because it's without the evidence, we, we would not have got the verdict, which we got. So may I say that there are lots, I've checked on maps, a lot of places there's no monitoring at all. And therefore that means no accountability. So please, we need to, you know, come together and insist from authorities, whether it's citywide, district-wide, you know, it is different in every country. And the coroner, again, so people who haven't seen the coroner's verdict, his narrative, really need to read it. It is very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rosamond. And let's pick up a little bit on this issue of accountability and monitoring. And maybe, uh, Basquiat, if I could bring you back in. We've heard Rosamond say, without evidence, there's no legal remedy. Without evidence, you can't get policymakers to take on the responsibility. This is obviously something in, in your work for, for the UN, you were looking at this and you were clearly gathering evidence. 
is that the big gap that we don't have sufficient robust evidence to be able to prove harm that would force action? What advice would you give to a potential activists watching this about how they use evidence in their in their campaigns? Well, I mean, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I mean, oftentimes the cases that would come before me, there was an abundance of evidence. There, it, it wasn't a lack of evidence. I mean, um, some of these cases are, are chemicals that have been known to be hazardous for over a century. The science is clear. It couldn't be more clear that they're hazardous, that there's no safe level of exposure, that children are the most vulnerable. And, and so the, the challenge for accountability was often the, uh, the reluctance of certain stakeholders, if, if you will, um, to acknowledge this and then financial interests. It wasn't so much the scientific uncertainty, uh, but that being said, there, there are huge evidence gaps. I mean, there are huge evidence gaps around the world um, and, and those evidence gaps do make it very, very difficult for victims to get access to remedies. Uh, and even in, in the UK, um, even in the UK, even for substances that have been designated to be possible carcinogens, I know that victims of, of pesticides and others still don't have enough scientific certainty to get access to effective remedies uh, to which they, they should be entitled. And so I appreciate the work of, of Julian and, and other activists around the world to, to lower the burden of proof, to put the burden of proof not on the, the victims to demonstrate harm and what has caused their harm, but on, on those that are polluting to demonstrate that they did not harm, so. Okay, yep. thank you. And can I bring you back in now, because I, I, I'm interested in exploring uh, your experience. I, you mentioned that, you know, you, you, um, that, that lung problems run in the family, and so, mm -hmm. and so you you would be, I suppose, classified as you know medically very vulnerable. And so, what would you say when policymakers say, "Well, uh, yes, you, you, poor you, you've got a medical problem. It's just your issue. We don't need to uh, limit everyone else's ability to to burn wood in their fire and do other things. You need to go and live in somewhere like Davos. And if you may take action, everyone else is fine. How do you make your story, which is you know built on the specific sensitivity that you have, and make it to a more general message that policymakers understand? Well, I am very sensitive for lung diseases, and my family, of course, is very sensitive. But there are so many people who are sensitive, and there are so many lung diseases. Um, and I think there is quite a lot of evidence that it is causing asthma and it is causing all kinds of health problems, the air pollution. And it's, uh, it's actually so much and it's so, uh, it's so common and there's so much harm that we sort of uh, think it's normal. Yeah, but I think it's not normal and we sh should do something about it. Yeah, and there are people dying and there, there's so much suffering and we know what to do about it. Okay, thank you. Julian, I'd like to bring you back in because this morning I was moderating another conference and that conference was on the EU agricultural outlook. And I had a bunch of farmers uh, in, in, in my conversation and several of them were saying that the challenges they had in increasing the productivity of the farms were EU rules that wouldn't allow them to use certain fertilizers, wouldn't allow you, them to use uh, chemical inputs and how important that was. And that, you know, it was hypocritical of the EU to allow some things to be produced here, but not used and therefore exported. And that this, so this is the farming community. Now, Julia, you said that many of the people that you work with, the other workers on farms had no idea of the risks to their health they were running on an everyday basis using fertilizers, herbicides and others. You know, how do we get the message through so that the farming community becomes, the agricultural community becomes a, a advocates for change it, rather than advocates to try and get rid of rules that they see as imposing and in affect their ability to do what they want to do? Sure. Well, in our uh, NGO, we help victims of pesticides, those who already uh, have already been poisoned, but we also 
have an awareness raising uh, aspect, which is how I got to be here, is uh, raising awareness of new users and in schools and so on. It's not a question of what we do and don't use, but when you use them, be careful how you do. And that is a very important. They are aware. I think that uh, younger generations are aware. The difficulty is the older generations who think they should do just what their parents did and things shouldn't change. Things are gradually moving. They are aware of some things that we did. I'm not that old, uh, but even 15, 20 years ago, what we did is very different from what people are doing now. So I, I'd like to add that uh, positive interpretation that they're more careful. Uh, I think that we could do even more uh, over and above awareness raising it's quite difficult, but this uh, money is, of course, something important. And we would uh, to, to think that we uh, make that the question is how much money do we spend compensating victims compared to the money that we uh, also make by using pesticides? That would be a consideration. Um, and also having compensation, which is uh, uh, commensurate with the uh, health impacts, we could take money from. Uh, uh, the states authorize products to be brought to market. How could we uh, work on that aspect? Uh, looking at uh, health systems that do not have enough information about improper use and the uh, firms themselves. Another financial consideration. If this is a little less profitable for them, uh, then and it costs a little more for health systems and for national governments, perhaps policymakers would be pushed to amend things so that they did not have to hand out so much money in compensation. Uh, uh, and perhaps if they didn't bring in so much money from pesticides that are prohibited in Europe, uh, uh, that are made in France, uh, but used um, in uh, Africa, India, and other countries uh, uh, with uh, people who are therefore exposed to these pollutants. The audience, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function um, because we have a fantastic panelist who, who are full of experience and, and positive energy for change. So feel free to submit your questions. Let me ask the panelists, you know, what advice would you give? There may be other people who, who are on this uh, webinar who are just at the beginning of their journey or want to know how to, you, to have more impact on the policy environment. You have all in your different areas made some changes and are pushing for it. What advice would you give to each of our, our audience members? And Rosamond, maybe I could start with you um, because um, I know that we may have limited amount of your time, but then I'm gonna ask everyone else, what's your advice? I've learned um, since COVID, it's very important that when you're thinking, I think sometimes we have an uh, idea, but executing it in reality sometimes does more damage than good. And I do think we need to look at the communities. It seems to be that poorer communities, the burden, they they make the least air pollution. So regarding cars, they can't even afford to own them. And yet they suffer the most air pollution. And it occurred to me before COVID actually, I started to realize it. I, I would come on webinars and people will suggest things and they're not part of the conversation, you see. And I worry sometimes whether we look at it from an academic point of view. And in reality, when you go out and put these policies in place, you do mean well, but it doesn't work out to their benefit. And I began to notice this because everyone I was speaking to was an academic of some sort or educated to a certain level. And yeah, and I really began to feel mm, the people who are affected, we don't really get to hear from them. And there seems to be a common theme around the world, actually. The poorest people are suffering most. And I think we need to ask ourselves, why is that? Why aren't they part of the conversation? They may have some ideas how to resolve this. I do think we need to be very, very careful um, because I did something quite rare um, recently. I went into the center of London in an, in an Uber because um, I normally go by train. So I was not aware of the amount of gridlock in London. Um, so although there are more cycle lanes, there are more, you know, all positive things, I suddenly thought, oh, goodness me, does that mean there's more air pollution? Now, measuring it, there may not be because the cars are, are newer, 
but the congestion was quite a surprise to me because I haven't seen it, you know, because I don't go in, I just take a train. So I, I don't go on the roads. I was very, very surprised. And I asked the driver, is this, you know, are there roadworks? Is this a one-off? And interesting, he said to me, no. And I've got a friend who doesn't drive, who goes to work by bus. And she has found herself more and more and more stuck in traffic, even on a bus. So I think we need to have a holistic view, the way we are designing things. Surely the people who are already suffering, i.e. those who live near main roads, they can't suffer anymore. Surely not. Thank, thank you, Rosamond. Um, and at the beginning of the, the session, Janon, uh, who was the, the founder and executive director of HEAL, explained that the, it's existed for almost 20 years. And one of the, the core focuses in the red thread in the DNA of the organization has always been that the voices of people most affected, most exposed and most in the front line should have a space in the policy environment because otherwise it is entirely academic and that this really needs to happen to bring the stories to the attention of policymakers. So this is this is very much Heal's mission. Laura, could I bring you in on this? Because again, yours is a, a, a relatively short path. You said just five years ago, uh, you discovered that there was a, a leak from this or, or either a leak or a deliberate re release from this a company and the extent to which it had uh, poisoned the groundwater and the food and the, you, you created a group of 100 mothers to come together and start to do things. What advice would you give from the your, your, your path, which sounds like it's had up and down moments, the legal cases and others? What's your best advice to advocates? To, to try to be united as, as much as possible, because you, you know, we are a lot of people impacted in in our area and uh, obviously we all are different ideas on how to manage this on how to uh, contact a different level of institution journalists i don't know <laughs> everything and all ideas are good all ideas need to be uh, developed uh the most important thing and uh, <laughs> i'm the first that sometimes have issues with this because um, we have so many things to do uh, and it, it is to to try to hear uh, someone else's opinion and uh, as Rosamond said uh, in, in the majority of cases the people who are most suffering uh, are the ones that are not speaking and so we need to to try to find them out to have their voices heard, not only us, but everyone. And uh, there are a, a lot of different stories here. For example, here probably the most impacted people are the farmers because they, they had not only, uh, they are not only impacted in their health, but also in their economy. And so we need to be united, as I said, and to, to come into um, common solutions. I would say that the best thing at all would be, would be to ban uh, certain chemicals uh, and avoid them to be created. If uh, then we are unable to uh, remediate the soil, air, and uh, and water. Thank you, Basco. Let me bring you uh, into our conversation at this point because we do have this general principle that the polluter pays. So in theory, we should have a system that we've got the precautionary principle, which, as you said, is used and abused and twisted. But then we also have this other principle of the polluter pays. And hearing the stories from the activists on, on the panel, it's quite clear that the people who are paying the price are individuals, it's families, it's kids, it's women who are exposed to it. What do we need to do to readjust things so that the polluter pays rather than the communities who are affected? Um. Well, I mean, there's there's many different ways to go about it. I mean, the, the U.S. has its experiences with a, a fund there for cleanup called the Superfund. Um, but in in my view, one of the best ways to to not only ensure that the polluter pays, but also to stimulate the development of safer alternatives with better better practices by industry, is to internalize the projected economic costs uh, at the outset. 
so that there are adequate incentives uh, for companies to develop alternatives to avoid the use of toxic chemicals at the beginning. Um, as, as my colleague uh, Liz Aturi says, to turn off the tap, so to speak. The, the experience of Denmark, I think, is quite telling, uh, and other Scandinavian countries as well, where they imposed large taxes, significant taxes, I should say, maybe not large, um, on, on pesticides. And then as a result, they have some of the lowest uh, rates of use of pesticides in Europe um, through those, those taxes or fees. Um, and, and there are other examples as well uh, of certain categories of products or classes of chemicals for which fees are levied, and those have stimulated some innovation. And I think that is, is one of the, the better ways to go about it, because as Lauren briefly noted in, in her presentation, the company responsible for the contamination in that region of Italy uh, has declared bankruptcy, and there are a myriad of different ways in which corporations have created opportunities or ways to avoid legal liability. And so the, the costs, if, it, if they are paid of cleanup often fall on the public one way, shape or form or another on public resources. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, both the panel and also the audience at this point, uh, Janon mentioned that we're just a few days away from the Commission launching uh, their zero pollution uh, strategy and, and actions. If I had Aladdin's lamp and I could, uh, I, I rubbed it until it shone and I could give each of you one wish, possibly three if you've got loads of ideas, one wish, what would you like policymakers to know and to do? in that zero pollution action plan. And Rosamond, I see you're, you're up first, but this is also an invitation to the audience. You can put it in the chat. What's your wish that policymakers knew and acted on? Rosamond. That, I'm gonna to have to go for a major ask. If, if, if I could wait. Aladdin's lamp, go for it. Children's right to breathe clean air easily. That for me will mean I might even retire tomorrow. She says, go back to teaching. If, if it means so much, I can't even explain it because Ella's right to life was breached and so are many others. So it means more to me than anything. And I think through that, then people will become or whoever's responsible then, you know, yeah, I think that I, I think about that all the time. So yeah. that's an easy one for me, but it's such a big ask, isn't it? But yeah, my, my wish is that no child would ever suffer how my daughter did. Cause yeah. um, I tried to explain it to somebody the other day. Um, it's a bit like being poisoned. So if you try and imagine children being poisoned, but they don't die quickly, slow, slowly. And some people, um, someone was on the call, I saw who has a lung condition. So they yeah. suffer for years and years and years. Yeah, it, it's something I, I think about quite a lot. So that's, that's an easy one for me, Tasmin. Thank you, Rosamond. So the, the, the wish is that policymakers acted as if children had a right to life and a healthy environment and that, uh, that it's a human right. So thank you for that. And um, after we've, I've asked all the panel, I'm going to invite the European a colleague from the European Commission to, to comment on this. And I know she's already uh, indicated that this, the, the rights to the child's rights to a healthy environment is recognized in the document. But Anne, let me bring you in next. Um, you, you were the person who shared your story of, of, of you know, just how much impact the difference in the quality of air makes to you, whether you can literally function on an everyday basis, but you have to live apart from your family. You have to be in another city or an, actually not even a city, far from uh, human pollution any in city. order to enjoy yeah. that, any city. <laughs> so what's your wish? Well, my personal wish, of course, is just to breathe and to breathe clean air and not just for me but for my children and for all our future children. Yeah. And I wish that the policymakers would focus on prevention and uh, therefore not just in healthcare, not uh, uh, trying to cover up or making, uh, invest a lot about making people better, but prevent illnesses. 
Thank you for that. And and, and you think with, with COVID being such a, with, there's never been a stronger political focus and media attention on breathing, the power of breathing, the, the difficulty of breathing, et cetera. I think this, this is our window of time to make it clear that for many people, daily life, there are, they are as deprived of clean air as people are who are suffering from COVID. And if we need action on that, I think there's, there's a window there that policymakers suddenly get what it's like not to be able to breathe properly and think this this is the reality for people like yourself and who are yeah. very sensitive to pollution in the air so this is an opportunity yeah. to move and it's forward. just that, you, that i and a lot of other patients we just want to do other things than just struggling for air thank you laura if i could give you aladdin's gift and i could uh, give give you the gift that policymakers would know and do something what would it be I would ask, uh, first of all, the policymakers uh, to have transparent information shared with uh, everyone, with the citizens and uh, uh, the inhabitants, uh, because unfortunately, all this uh, situation that was caused in Italy was due mainly to the fact that uh, someone was aware of this, but this was not made uh, aware to the, to the uh, inhabitants, to the citizens, uh, we had not the right uh, to choose uh, which water use for our children. So, and what I also told uh, to Marcos Orellana that was uh, in Italy uh, and with us uh, last Saturday, I explained that I don't want uh, children uh, that are having this um, company footprint in their blood. And why I'm telling this? Because we are having children uh, with the, these compounds in their blood at birth, unfortunately, because they are taking these when they are during pregnancy, so when they are within uh, their mother's womb. So I don't want this footprint in our children's blood anymore. Thank you, Laura, a very powerful wish. Julien, can I invite you to share, if I had the gift to give you a wish, what would you like policymakers to do and act on? What I would like is, I think they know what they should do, but we'll repeat it uh, so they should know it. The things we've been saying for a long time, two things, the first thing is that they should stop uh, marketing CM, um, uh, uh, cancerogenic uh, uh, chemicals on the market. These are things that we can do without uh, in farming. There are other alternatives that are easy to use. That would be easy to do in the medium term. And the second thing uh, that I'll say that once you're ill, uh, that everybody should be able to have reparation and that everybody should have, this, uh, everybody in the world should have the same rights as we have in France to have compensation funds for people who've been affected, European compensation fund to compensate people who've been contaminated by products that have been marketed uh, uh, and that have paid into these companies' profits. Well, I think everyone everyone has made some some very good wishes, and there's not a whole lot more I could I could wish for. But maybe one one thought from my side is that uh, governments recognized that the state of the science today will not be the state of science tomorrow, or five years, or ten years down the road. Uh, what we know today. Uh, is, is not going to be uh, health protective 10 or 15 years down the road. And so we really need to focus on prevention and elimination uh, as much as possible to, to minimize the health impacts that, that are resulting today. Thank you very much. Before I hand the floor over to uh, Veronica Manfredi from the Commission to comment on it, I'd like to bring Janon back in because you opened our conversation by explaining why almost 20 years of activism has been inspired by the work of communities fighting to protect themselves, their families and advocate for their rights. Um, can you just give us a, a, a brief sense of how this 
this webinar with the messages of people affected by pollution, how are you going to use that to help drive the work you're going forward? Thank you, Tams, and I hope it's, I just took off my earphones. Can you hear me okay? Great, yeah. okay. Well, I am just trying to absorb all of the amazing um, information and more ideas for stories that we have heard today. And I think we have so many opportunities to use what has been said today. First of all, we are going to definitely have a recording that will be up and we were gonna be promoting this. So today is not the only time that uh, the, this messages will be uh, taken away. And we're also very much hoping to continue to use it, uh, maybe uh, highlight it in our stake, uh, the platform, um, Zero Pollution platform, um, which will be happening, I think, next week. And as we go forward, we're going to be coming back to not only the people on this panel, but hopefully we will have identified other communities and groups and try to be more proactive in bringing those voices in our position papers and our advocacy and our social media and outreach with policymakers. Um, and I think most of all, we're gonna be very inspired and remember what we are doing and why. So thank you. Thank you, Janon. And it has indeed been a privilege listening to people sharing their experiences and how they have transformed their personal stories into these incredibly impactful messaging networks, groups, activities to affect real change. Veronica, let me introduce you and let me invite you to now take the floor. You're from uh, DG Environment, the part of the commission that has responsibility for these areas around environment and health. How do you respond to the things that you've just heard and how can you take some of this energy and these, these requests? I mean, you possibly can't personally grant Aladdin's lamp wishes, but how can you translate this expectation from citizens into action that could have a real impact for them? Thanks a lot, Tamsin. First of all, let me tell you that I feel uh, so encouraged and enthused by all what I hear to the extent that I really feel a strong recognition that what we are doing what we have published and what we are preparing is really on the right track. What do you mean? First of all, uh, you know that the European Commission actually has already adopted both a chemicals strategy and the zero pollution action plan. These two documents, which have to be really seen together, come with super important messages and announcement of practical actions for all the people that have been speaking today. Why? We have, for example, said that for PFAS, we are going to ban them except for exceptional uses. Work is ongoing inside our departments and in cooperation with European Chemicals Agency to secure that we go towards, at all times, the less toxic options. Uh, a few weeks ago, a few months already ago, our commissioner, Commissioner Sinkevichus, has actually launched a high level roundtable with the biggest CEOs of the chemical industry, basically to try and implement all the principles of this chemical strategy and translate it into action, what do they entail? They entail the basic notion that in Europe, we want to move progressively towards what we call safe by design, the low toxicity as the principle. When we revised the drinking water directive uh, in 2018, we looked at PFAS very precisely, and may I also report with a lot of engagement by the Italian government that I think has well understood how serious the situation has been in the Veneto region with the gravity of the problem that Laura Facciolo has been so vividly bringing to us. I think we are united in saying never, never again. And this is why in the revised drinking water directive that is going to become applicable across the European Union as from June 2023, the rules on admittance of PFAS are extremely stringent. We are close to zero allowable limits. Also, I heard a lot and I sympathize a lot with the request for make evidence finding much easier. Rosamund was very strong on this one monitoring, clarity. There is a lot of work in the pipeline in the European Commission. In the Zero Pollution Action Plan adopted in May, we have announced that for the very first time in December 2022, we will come up with the first ever zero pollution monitoring 
an outlook report. This means that for the first time across the 50 years of working also from our side on pollution prevention rules, we are going to try and bring them together to give to our citizens a picture of how well we are performing when it comes to air, waters, both fresh waters and seas, and of course, soil pollution. On soil, let me tell you, as you may know, that we have launched just a few weeks ago on the 17th of November, the first strategy on soil pollution that is going to, that has also announced the possibility of having a law on the health of soil. I was so sensitive to the points that Julien brought forward, pesticides and cancers of farmers. And I think that your remark, uh, Tamsin, are very pertinent. It's the paradox of agriculture. They are often the first in lines to suffer. Unfortunately, if, if we go and visit certain oncological departments of some hospitals, even here in Flanders, a lot of the patients are actually farmers. And yet, there is a resistance to change in the name of, I think Julian said it again, money, production, habits, mindset shift. And here again, I think that Rosamund and other colleagues, Anne and others said it actually, but when they said the doctors, the doctors, huh? the doctors that play this crucial role in helping people understand to connect the dots. And then when it comes to the right to remedies and to redress, don't you think that we live a little bit of paradox today? People can get a decent redress as consumers if they buy a detergent in a supermarket and it happens to be, I don't know, something that has a misleading packaging element, et cetera. So they, if they've suffered a certain level of economic damage, we have by now across European Union, new rules on consumer collective redress. Yet, if your child and maybe other children suffer of chronic asthma or like in Rosamund case, they die, there isn't anything written black and white that really facilitate consumer, sorry, collective redress actions. I personally believe, and here I speak really in my personal capacity as the director for zero pollution, that this is the area where we have to work together and where I need uh, even more uh, organizations like HEAL that give the voice to those who usually don't speak. Those who speak are the big corporations, are the representatives of our current economic model. If we don't manage to outreach to those who are impacted the most, we will always have a kind of, you know, bias the picture on the ground. So that's why indeed the work of the NGOs is so crucial. Uh, Finally, uh, if I may say, I think that it's also very fair to make the point that it's important to make polluting much less interesting business. And there I think you enter into the area of penalties, sanctions. Today in the majority of the European uh, laws, we have a standard uh, sentence that says that it's up to the member states to set the sanctions in case uh, pollution takes place. And these sanctions must be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. This is standard legal text. The reality on the ground is that I think we see enormous discrepancies across our 27 member states, uh, with only a fraction of them really going towards, in my view, truly dissuasive sanction that possibly look also at the turnover of the companies that commit certain breaches. And uh, these also indeed having, you know, a new way of thinking of the sanction could also create indeed a liquidity stream for possibly having either at national level, at EU level, specific funds to compensate the victims. But I would hope, first and foremost, to prevent at source. What can I bring today to the table? I can bring also the fact that the Zero Pollution Action Plan has been setting quantitative targets that we have to achieve by 2030. When I think of air pollution, you will have seen that we've said black and white, and this is coming out of implementation of the existing acquis, that by 2030, we want to have cut by another 55% the amount of people suffering of air pollution diseases. This is really implementation of the existing acquis, but in parallel, we have committed to table in 2022, a revision of our current ambient air quality directives that precisely will look at the just adopted guidelines of the WHO in order to more closely align with them. So 
I must say, please get familiar really with all the 33 very precise actions announced by the Zero Pollution Action Plan. They are partly legislative and partly, I would really say, engaging actions because we also believe, like all the speakers in today's panel, that unless we speak and engage with all the communities that are often at the same time, the pressure cause and the victims of the pressures that we realize, we will not change the reality on the ground. And this is also why I'm so happy to have Hill, indeed, as a member of the Zero Pollution Stakeholder Platform that will be launched by Vice President Timmermans and Commissioner Sinkevicius next week on the 16th. That is a perfect fora where we want to engage among these stakeholders, but also with other fora that all do job that is very pertinent for reducing pollution, be it the circular economy stakeholder platform, the biodiversity platforms, the climate pact platform, where together we can concretely elaborate ways to translate all the actions into reality on the ground. This is what we want. And I think that we are really united with you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Veronica. And it's very welcome to have someone from the European Commission who has such passion and commitment and interest in engaging and is willing to both listen to the stories from people affected by pollution and then is willing also to take that into account when these policies are being developed. Of course, this is going to be a, a long battle, but uh, we take the strong message, I think, that the area that now needs to be built up in terms of either legislation or practice is the capacity for collective redress. Um, the, uh, I think Laura spoke a little bit about this, how she's in, in Italy, they're taking a case on behalf of 100 people who are affected by a legal case to force change. And this, this is the issue looking at remedies so that it becomes less, less of a uh, winning business proposition to pollute as a mechanism to make sure that we prevent it. So you've highlighted a number of different areas. And I think the, the message for all of us here today is we need better information so people know both about their rights and what risks they're exposed to so that they can do things about it. We need to make sure that we can prevent um, things that pollute because this is obviously the, the key area and we need legal tools, financial tools, and we need to have processes in place and we need much greater accountability. We come to the end of our time together and honestly it was such a privilege and inspiring to hear the stories of different people sharing their personal experiencing and explaining how th what their lived experience was turned them into advocates and activists for change and what can be achieved when people come together and, and use what tools that are there but nobody has to do this alone that's why NGOs like HEAL create the space uh, to come together, to share experience and information, to strategize and to be able to have access to open the door at policy level so we can achieve real change. I want to say a warm thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. It was really fascinating uh, and I hope you had a, you, you've you gone away inspired. Uh, it was thought provoking. Thank you all and see you again soon and please stay safe and have a very happy holiday.